Emmanuel. Can I say, can I hear you say, God is with me. Are you sure? Yes. Say thank you, Jesus. Yes. Say thank you, Jesus. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You may be seated. I'm here with a message given to me as a gift from my father and the Lord, Prophet T.B. Joshua. And I believe as you listen to this message, you will be healed. Yeah. Come on, let me hear you. You will be healed. Yeah. You will be delivered. Yeah. You will be blessed. Yeah. You will be saved. Yeah. I mean, you will be set free. Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. Say thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Open your, my heart. Open my heart to your word. Open my heart to your faith. Open my heart to your spirit. Say in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. The Bible says that you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. In John chapter 8, verse 32. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you ready to know the truth? One of the first, the greatest, the most sublime and necessary truths in the compass of nature is that God is spirit. The spirit has no flesh and bones. Who knows the way of the spirit that he may instruct him on how to worship God? Amazingly, some people worship God just to please others or to be seen. But privately, they worship the gods of their forefathers. That was what the Bible referred to in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And also in the book of Revelation chapter 3, from verses 15 to 20, as halting between two opinions. I believe that there can be no other God but one. The one who is infinite, supreme, and all-sufficient. He is our Heavenly Father. In reference to this, men are called to worship their Heavenly Father. Thus the Lord's Prayer begins our Father who art in heaven, as in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. I take it again. In reference to this, men are called to worship the heavenly Father. Our Lord's prayer begins in this manner, our Father who art in heaven. It is required of all who worship God, that they worship Him in spirit and in truth. This divine mandate given to us to recognize our spiritual union with Christ in the spirit shall lead us to a message titled, The Real Object of Worship. Can I see you write it down? The Real object of worship and our proof text shall be taken from the book of John the book of John chapter 4 let us read from verse 19 the woman said to him sir I perceive that you are a prophet our fathers worshipped on this mountain and you Jews 
say that in Jerusalem is the place where we ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. Verse 24. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit. Must worship in spirit and truth. A message. The real object of worship. God is spirit. For he is an infinite and an internal. God is spirit for he is an infinite and internal mind. An intelligent being, incorporeal, immaterial, invisible, and incorruptible. If God were not a spirit, he could not be perfect, nor infinite, nor eternal, nor independent, nor the father of spirits. Because God is spirit, Christ came to declare God to us that God is a spirit in the spirit. In the beginning, God, a spirit, spoke and created the material things. This shows that the spirit is greater than the material. If we do not worship God in spirit, if we do not worship God who is a spirit in the spirit, hmm, we need to give him the glory due to his name. Nor can we perform the act of worship. And so, we will not receive his favor and acceptance. Therefore, we miss the end of the worship, which is the salvation of our souls. Then it means that we worship ourselves. For example, the Samaritans worshipped, I mean, believed in the same God with the Jews. They incorporated the worship of idols with God's worship. They might be justly said to worship him whom they did not properly know. Why? Because they did not depend on God's spirit to worship God. If you do not depend on God's spirit to worship God, you are worshiping a God you do not know. When you worship a God you do not know, surprises come. For instance, you ask for deliverance and demonic attacks come. Therefore, the worship of the Samaritans was a kind of worship, I mean, was a defective worship. Why? Because they did not receive the prophetical writings. That of the Jews was a kind of worship dealing only on the letters, in the letters and referring to the spirit and design which were at a distance by types and ceremonies. What are we saying? Today, when you meet a professing Christian, you may not find any shrine or objects of worship idols or images such a person can beat his chest and say i'm a christian i am not an idol worshiper we say we are christians and that is why we go to the church we go to church but how many of us would still remain in the church after receiving a phone call asking us to come and collect 
the money, position, employment, relationships, material, I mean physical or material needs we have been expecting. Remember how many times you have been absent from the church because you have received an urgent call concerning money. Concerning money, concerning relationship, concerning employment, concerning position, concerning physical or material needs. Can you see why? Can you see the reasons people defect? I mean, some people defect or they camp carnally from the place God has destined them to be. Come to think of it, what is an idol and who is? An idol worshiper. Ask your neighbor, what is an idol? Can I hear you? Say, what is an idol, neighbor? Who is an idol worshiper? Can I see you touch somebody? Say, who is an idol worshiper? An idol is anything that is placed above God in our hearts. If it is yourself, money, position, employment, family, relationships, situations, physical or material needs that you place above God in your heart, then you, money, position, employment, relationship, family, your situation, I mean, your physical or material needs would become your idol, God, or object of worship. And you would be called an idol worshiper. Because men have derailed from worshiping God who is a spirit in the spirit. Jesus Christ, the Messiah, came in the flesh, came in the flesh to declare God to us that God is a spirit in the spirit. The Messiah was to spring from the Jews, from them the preaching of the gospel and the knowledge of the truth was to go to all the nations of the world. You may ask, who is a Jew? Ask your neighbor, who is a Jew? Come on, say, who is a Jew? Ask Apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter 2, from verses 28 to 29. And he would tell you, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. As Christians, when we genuinely believe in Christ Jesus and sincerely embrace his faith crucified, I mean Christ crucified, then we are the circumcision. We are the circumcision, we who have embraced the faith of Christ crucified are now entered into the new covenant. Into a new covenant. And according to this covenant, 
worship God in the spirit exalting making our boast of Christ Jesus as the only savior only healer only deliverer only Messiah not having any confidence in the flesh or outward right or in any of the outward rights or ceremony prescribed by Jewish institutions as in Philippians chapter 3 verse 3 as Christians we must mind the power more than the form When we are talking of confidence, we are not talking of confidence in the flesh. Hence, as Christians, our confidence is in the message of the cross. For it is the power of God to salvation. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And also in Romans chapter 1 verse 16, he also said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Your confidence may be a medicine your confidence may be in institutions you have PhDs or in the flesh but if it contradicts God's word it destroys your prayer it destroys your faith life we all know what happens when the faith light goes out the Bible says that when the faith light goes out life becomes a weary road hence as Christians we should mind the power not the form we should aim at God's glory and not to be seen by men and draw near to God with a true heart as in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 and Psalm chapter 51 verse 6 respectively herein lies the way through a genuine worship expresses itself through a genuine worship ex must express itself in obedience and commitment to God through a genuine worship must express itself in obedience and commitment to God the essence of true or genuine worship is in honoring God with what our life depends on remember the case of Abraham remember the case of the widow's might remember the Zerophite woman do you honor God with what your life depends on Jesus still has harsh words for those who pay mere lip service to God in the book of Matthew chapter 23 verse 27 he said what to you teachers of the law and Pharisees you hypocrites and also in Matthew chapter 7 verse 21 he also said not everyone who says to me lord lord will enter the kingdom of heaven but only he who does the will of my father who is in heaven in saying this jesus knew that people could put on an outward appearance that does not spring from the mind as we all know, a hypocrite says one thing and believes another. Right from the days of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Adam, when they disobeyed God, when they were misled, deceived 
by this spirit of deception in his neck. God's spirit has been distorting the spirit of deception. In our days, we know that the spirit of Jesus Christ does not delight in the waving of hands in worship without a thorough reformation of heart and life. For he himself knows that true Christianity lies in the heart, in the purity of the heart. May I ask you, are you inwardly pure? Are you under the check and conduct of the Holy Spirit? Are you beautiful on the outside, but on the inside very, very ugly? Today, man may do much by outward restraints. For example, I will not drink again. I will not smoke again. I will not fornicate again. I will not lie again. I will not steal again. But only God can help them to stop sinning by the influence of his spirit, the Holy Spirit. What do we need to do if we have found ourselves in this realm? We must depend on God's spirit. I mean, we must depend wholly, entirely on God's spirit. If we must fetch in help and grace from above to enable us to do that, which we cannot do ourselves. This calls for total humility and sincerity of the mind. For those who would come to God must do so in humility and sincerity. For these are essential characteristics of purity. If you come to God with a humble and reformed spirit, he would welcome you. Tell your neighbor you are welcome. Come on, let me hear you. Say you are welcome. I can see you smiling. Smile to somebody. Come on, let me see your beautiful face. Smile to someone. Come on, smile and shake somebody. Say you are welcome. You are welcome. Hallelujah. Yes, you are welcome. Worship must be pure. As you are here to worship, worship must be pure. The requirements of purity must be met. I mean, must be kept. And sacrifices are to be offered from a pure heart. A heart that does not bear grudges. A heart that is pure, a heart that is humble and sincere, not a rebellious one. For a rebellious heart is an idolatrous heart. Remember the case of Ananias and Sapphira. They were rebellious to the instruction of the Spirit of God in the life of Apostle Peter. Remember the case of the rich young ruler. He had money as his idol in his heart. And he became rebellious to the new instruction of Jesus to follow him. By selling all his possession and, and giving it to the poor, he said no. He was rebellious. For a rebellious heart is an idolatrous heart. Finally, finally, brethren in Christ Jesus, in the past... God Almighty overlooked the ignorance of looking at him as an image, looking at him on the outside, or comparing him to an object of other concern. But now, he no longer overlooks such acts. Because God is spirit, Christ came to declare God to us, that God is a spirit in the spirit. Remember, in the beginning, God, a spirit, spoke and created 
the material things. And this shows that the spirit is greater than the material things. Therefore, we do not need, we no longer need to go after the symbol since the real object, I mean, since the real object is around, you may ask, who is the real object of worship? Jesus Christ is the real object of worship. And he is present in our midst through his word and by his spirit. In other words, Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit is the real object of worship. In him, I mean, by his resurrection, Jesus has demonstrated that he is worthy of being the object of our faith, of being the object of our belief, and the center of our own world. In him is access to all the promises and blessings. So, let us Worship the Lord with a fixedness of thought and with a flame of affection. All that is within us, all we have, and all we can do. Let us depend on God's spirit to worship God, who is a spirit in the spirit. This is the true meaning of today's message titled the real object of worship. Because you have decided to depend on God's spirit to worship God who is a spirit in the spirit. I tell you, even though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. And you and your household shall dwell in the house of the Lord. Now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. I leave you with Jesus. Worship him. He is the real object of worship.